and we're very much interested in um, biological structure of not only small molecules and single proteins, but also protein complexes. Um, my center operates as, um, is funded by the NIH, National Institute for General Medical Sciences, and we're a biomedical research technology center and have been for several decades. We're located at the UCSF Mission Bay campus, and the uh, activities of our center are primarily focused on developing interactive visualization tools and more recently web-based applications, and then together with our collaborators, applying these tools to uh, important bi and biomedically relevant projects. And because we are a center uh, and are funded by NIH to do more than just research, we're also involved in uh, service to the scientific community, um, and we have workshops. Uh, for, in fact, Scooter Morris was here on Tuesday, gave a workshop on Chimera. We do workshops around, it, around the country several times a year, and we disseminate all of the software that I'll be talking about today um, and publish our methods, that sort of thing. So um, some of the tools that we've developed I'll be, are, are shown here. I'll be talking more about Chimera, so I won't talk about that now. We've also developed a number of Cytoscape plugins. You'll hear a bit about biological visualization of biological context in general from Scooter Morris during the next session. And he may mention a bit about some of these specific plugins that we've developed for Cytoscape. I'll, I'll just mention briefly that we're also involved in a collaborative activity with Patsy Babbitt at UCSF to develop a database that links sequence, structure, and function, especially for mechanistically diverse enzyme superfamilies, so that you can um, search in either sequence, structure, or function space. And by function, biological function, I'm talking about the chemical reactions that enzymes perform, and in particular, the partial chemical reactions. And in fact, it's this partial, a common partial chemical reaction that often uh, causes key residues in proteins to be conserved over a very long period of time because it's the, that chemistry is needed in, in, to perform biological function. I won't have time to talk about the SFLD today, but you see the URL down here. And if you're interested, please go to the, to the website and browse or search or enter your own favorite sequence. So Sean mentioned a bit about structural biology. I'll say the overarching goal of structural biologists are to create an accurate spatial temporal model of, in, I believe the dream at least, is the complete cell and all of its molecular processes, and of course, maximal ac accuracy, resolution, and completeness. Um, the, of course, why do you want to do this? If by having models, it uh, will help understand how some of the machinery that you see depicted here works, how it's evolved over a, a long period of time, how it can be controlled, modified, and potentially even, even engineered for, for uh, future use. One of the challenges that are associated with this is one of scale, molecular scale, the function from whole cells down to small molecules uh, represents six orders of magnitude. That's a, a large amount. And even for scientists, it's sometimes not easy to think about. Uh, one of the analogies I like to make is if this small ligand down here was the size of one of us, you know, this, the diameter of this human cell, that's the distance from Boston to Jacksonville, Florida. So how do small molecules like this have a biological effect, overall systems effect, in large uh, uh, organelles such as, as whole cells? There's a, a number of different challenges at the experimental level for obtaining data across all these six orders of magnitude and then analyzing that data and representing it in some form that allows us to, our knowledge and use of the models to change with these different scales. So one of the tools that my group has been developing now for, um, for over a decade is called Chimera. 
It's a versatile package of, uh, for molecular visualization and analysis. It's written primarily in Python, making it highly extensible and also relative, uh, platform independent. It's got a lot of documentations, tutorials, and sort of little video vignettes on how to go about using it. And we've worked hard to interface with other computational uh, biology and computational chemistry tools. Um, it's free for any of this group here, which is essentially everybody except commercial drug companies. Um, and uh, it's been used, uh, downloaded hundreds of thousands of times, and we are fortunate that it's been cited in several thousand journal articles at this point. I don't have time today to talk about the breadth of a display and analysis capable with Chimera, but I've sort of put on this slide and the next slide just uh, a few little uh, tidbits so that uh, you can see the kind of things where you can display both uh, sequence alignments and structural alignments and facilely move back and forth between either structure space or sequence space, highlighting or modifying parts in either. Um, one of the common things that is, or uh, at least a, a interesting uh, component of structural biology and especially within uh, biotechnology and pharmaceutical industry is being able to dock uh, virtual libraries of small compounds with receptor sites of proteins. And um, although the docking itself is outside the scope of Chimera, Chimera uh, interfaces with things like Autodoc Vena and doc, uh, UCSF doc to, to uh, visualize the results and interactively um, analyze the results. Um, as you try to model uh, proteins and protein complexes, there's a whole field devoted to comparative modeling, and uh, Chimera is very much involved in that, again, interfacing to other software, and then you, Chimera uh, can visualize and interactively interact with that, that other software. And you'll see various schematic depictions, and as well as a, a wealth of different types of displays, and calculations such as electrostatic charge and, and um, other types of things. So Chimera is very much focused on interactive visualization and analysis. And you'll see that uh, because I intend to show you a demo of some things. Another key aspect of Chimera that has received a lot of our attention in recent years is visualization of, of volumes, of volumetric data data that can either come from light microscopy. Here you see a single cell, uh, HL60 uh, cell that is uh, migrating um, in this volume of space. This, was, this data was captured by Bessel beam 3D microscopy in real time. It's a very uh, high data intensive, high uh, volume or uh, you know, data volume uh, technique, but allows you to see the motions of cells in real time. And you can see the phylopodia here that are, that are extending out and you can't see the individual actin filaments, but the way that this cell uh, maintains its motility is through uh, an act, act, <laughs> actin interaction. A number of other um, displays of, of, from volume visualization. Some of those of you that are in the front can probably see some uh, crystal structures here and in here that have been docked into these um, lower resolution electron micrographs. Uh, here's an electron tomogram down here. Um, here's a, a, a icosahedral virus where we have built a a cage around the virus built a mo so to model the symmetry within the virus. So I don't propose to talk about these in really any detail, just to show you sort of the breadth of volumetric visualization capabilities within Chimera. I do want to talk about uh, integrative modeling, however, because it's really the from a couple slides ago, those com protein complexes where the complexes either represent motions or pores of some kind or um, uh, cell transport mechanisms. And it's uh, difficult to have a single experimental technology that can capture all of the spatial tempor temporal data that represents those models. And so we're using 
uh, in collaboration with others, uh, integrative modeling to, uh, to complete, to build models of these kinds of things. And in this case, the source of information really can come from any sorts of, from any sorts of measurements. You see a number of experimental techniques that are listed here from crystallography and NMR that Sean talked about to electron tomography, um, chemical cross-linking, um, resonance imaging, um, with, through FRET, any, and even and computational methods as well. So the goal with integrative modeling is to take any of the, all of these data sources and those restraints on the model system that they represent, whether it's low or high resolution, and combine them together into models that are consistent with the data. Um, the popular program that uh, Andre Sali's lab at UCSF has developed to do this kind of thing is called the Integrative Modeling Program, IMP. And you see it schematically represented here where we take various parts that have been either modeled, various parts of a complex that have been either modeled or determined experimentally together with the restraints that come with this data, and then combine these together into making models, in this case of the nuclear pore complex that was uh, published uh, a couple years ago now. Uh, so this is what's used to transport molecules into the cell nucleus. Here's a, a schematic representation where individual proteins are just represented as blobs. Here's a little bit higher resolution version where now we're representing parts of proteins as spheres. And here's a dynamic representation of this model of the cell showing transport through the, through the pore complex. So there are a variety of models that can be built um, using IMP. And depending on the level of detail and uh, scale that you want, it may be uh, necessary to do things at a very low level or it, it may be possible to do things at a much higher level, and this green box represents the chimera tools and web applications in this spectrum of integrative modeling. Sorry. So uh, as part of this, it's been necessary to develop a new uh, data representation and, and a molecular format. We call it the rich molecular format, RMF. And here's a schematic representation, sort of a part of that nuclear pore complex that you saw in the earlier slide, where we've just let spheres represent uh, different resolutions for different parts of the structure. And then we have a rich user interface here for referring to these parts of the structure, either by features, and you can highlight features here in the interface and see where they are on the model, or vice versa. Um, uh, it's easiest to, when you think of this as a very, where the resolution is a very hierarchical sorts of, and, and the collection of proteins represent a hierarchical view. So there's a hierarchical view structure where you can select and expand uh, different parts of the structure if you need, if you are interested in more details, uh, a 2D map so you can look at some of the restraint scores so you can see wh what from the integrative model, um, what were the restraints that derived a particular configuration. Of course, we're interested in how things change over time as well. And so there's a way of looking at multiple frames or multiple confirmations of, the, of these models and um, not only playing through them, but selecting individual frames. So um, if I have time, I'll show you a little, uh, a quick demo of, the, of this sort of thing. But we're proposing that RMF, which was developed in collaboration with Andre Sali and, and others, uh, be considered as a possible uh, data standard. This, you know, it's beyond what an individual uh, crystal structure provides with the PDB, and it's a way of thinking, it's sort of it, the metadata, if you will, of, which represents the relationships of all the different proteins in a protein complex, such as the nuclear pore. Some other work that we're doing, and this is in collaboration with Graham Johnson, who is now at UCSF, and who gave, it was, uh, is here in the audience and gave a tutorial on 
Tuesday as well. Uh, we're looking at um, using Graham's auto pack and cell pack to build models that have, uh, that again, solve this integrative modeling problem with, um, of biological structure. So quickly, the way to think about this is you start with an empty volume. In this case, with AutoPack, we have some arbitrary components here, cylinders, spheres of different sizes. We know through experimental methods the approximate percent uh, uh, the ingredients, the target densities, if you will, of these different components. And the challenge here is to pack these components at these percentages into this volume such that there are no violations of the, of the edge. And so AutoPack does that. And the companion, companion cell pack module does things now with uh, biologically relevant components such as synaptic vessels and transmembrane proteins, packing these according to those same kinds of rules that you saw to make biologically relevant models. I somehow I've lost the uh, auto, the remote forwarding here, but we can. So we combine these together uh, generate output files and then do visualization and analysis on the results using uh, a number of tools, but in the, in the case that I'm going to be showing you, Chimera. Hmm. So here's an, an animation that was generated of, with Chimera from the um, the output of auto pack and cell pack. This is an HIV, a model of HIV caps virus um, showing the uh, HIV spikes on the surface. Uh, a couple broadly neutralizing antibodies. Here's the HIV capsid. Here's one of the capsid proteins. And here are a couple small drug molecules that are known to bind and inhibit the formation of this multimeric complex in HIV. So the way this uh, animation was created, we used the output from uh, AutoPack, uh, fed it into Chimera, took individual um, scenes of the resulting image, saved those scenes away, and then strung them all together into a timeline, and then created a movie from that timeline. And it's just. And that's shown on this slide. So this is a relatively new feature of Chimera that we've recently added, um, where you can uh, interactively manipulate. In this case, we've, we've uh, clipped off part of the, um, of the overall uh, um, coat, vesicle coat here, so that you can see inside the cell. We've saved various scenes. You, you manipulate things. You get the view you want. You hit the plus button. It saves that scene. And in the, the 3D, the data associated with that 3D confirmation. And then you can drag these scenes down onto a timeline uh, and connect one time point with another time point with various commands, such as rock back and forth or rotate or morph from one transition to a next. And that's the way that that video was created. Hmm. Um, I mentioned that we are in a very collaborative and, in a, uh, and interactive environment at, at my center. So we have a video projector, much like you see here, and a, a large wall display. and. Um, one of the key ways that we interact is through with groups of people. In this case, uh, this was a demonstration we were doing for a young group of, of individuals who are interested in science. They have their, their 3D glasses on. Um, you know, we are, we're trying to manipulate 3D images, and you need rich ways of interacting with those images, much the way that Sean described, either through six devices like this 3D connection 
which is six degrees of freedom, or tablet, or you know these magic trackpads where you can use finger gestures, or some new things like this leap motion that can detect uh, hand gestures. So I want to spend um, a few minutes just doing. I don't think I'm going to have time for all these demos. Valerie, how, how am I doing on time? Okay, great. So let's see. Let's do. Um, we'll do. I'll do the electron tomogram of HIV. Uh, I think that's the the one I want to show you. Well, well, well. Okay. So I'm running Chimera on my, my MacBook Air here, which is now, I don't know, three years old, something like that. Uh, Chimera takes advantage of the, the graphics processing unit that are part of all um, laptops and desktops now. Um, so what you see here is, uh, is HIV um, virus. So there's a... Um, a, a an oily uh, sphere that protects the, the underlying virus, the virus structure here, this lipid envelope. We've just artificially cut that in half so you can see inside. This is, by the way, is elect data from electron tomography. So these are 3D density maps, and they've been artificially colored just according to the components. Um, the red is HIV capsid. We're going to be looking more at that in detail and, and seeing some of the, the fundamental structural elements of HIV capsid. The blue is this lipid uh, layer that protects the capsid. And then the, the gold or yellow particles that you see here are just, is just protein debris that's been left over from the formation of the capsid. So um, I, I told you that Chimera has a rich set of of uh, functionality, and I, I'll just go, scroll down kind of the tools menu and show you some of these things without having, of course, time at all to go into any detail. But there's tools for structural analysis, such as uh, finding H bonds or looking at clashes or measuring angles and torsions and geometries and ellipsoids, a, a number of different rendering things. We have a fairly rich set of tools for doing structural comparison. So comparing one protein structure with another, emphasizing the differences or the um, a number of different things. There's a number of uh, sequence structure tools that you see here. Things to do uh, surface binding and analysis to modify structures and, and build structures. Um, prepare things for either doing uh, molecular dynamics calculations with programs like AMBER or uh, uh, analysis, uh, analyzing uh, MD, the ensembles generated by molecular dynamics calculations. So a number of things here and a, a large list of volume of visualization tools, uh, including analysis. But what I'm going to bring up, I'm going to bring up some simple things. <laughs> I'm going to bring up a model panel so that we can modify, uh, look at different parts of the structure. And I'll bring up a, um, a viewing panel here, what we call our side view. So the side view, which is um, over here on the right-hand side, just represents your eye, this square, yellow square box, looking at the structure. So uh, you know, if I want to make it bigger, I just bring my eye closer or bring it farther away. Uh, the vertical yellow lines represent clipping planes, so I can adjust those clipping planes and clip through parts of the structure. Um, and you see a number of different controls about camera angle and rotations and things with lighting and a, a number of different things. The model panel, sorry, i just put this away. By the way, this, this demo and the demo files are available on our website, so you can download Chimera, and then you can download the demo files and, and follow through with the, uh, the web page and do all these things uh, yourself if you're so uh, inclined. Um, so what I want to do is uh, I'll just I'll zo I'll look in at the at the, um, the 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 core surfaces and the sorry let's highlight this. 
this, this. We'll only show those posts. So we'll, we'll clip away the other things. And now we're just looking at the virus, the HIV virus capsid. So here, blobs, the blobs you see represent whole proteins. And I've color coded, and the, by the way, the gold here is cyclophilin A. That's a human protein that's needed by the virus for infectivity and replication. And you'll see I've, colored, I've color coded things a little bit differently. In, for different parts of the structure. And that has to do with the greens are hexameric units of HIV capsid, and the purple are pentameric units. Okay, and that, so you're wondering why are there, and these are this, all the same protein. So uh, 12 copies of pentamers and a few hundred copies of hexamers. And you may be wondering, well, why is that the case? So. One way to see that is I'll turn on a, a, a cage that we've built. Um, so this is just a model now of the, hint of the pentameric and hexameric units. And, <clears throat> and from here you can see that five copies of the pentameric units on one end and seven copies on the other end are what provide the, um, the change in angle. So this is not a spherical protein, obviously, and it's got this... Um, asymmetry that is incorporated by the pentamer. So much like instead of a soccer ball, this is this elongated shape. And it's the, the data from this, these cages, these pentameric units, match very well with, if I turn, I can turn on and off the surfaces, you can see that the, the cage very much represents. And so the accurate version of the model. And so this is another instance where you really need multiple forms of a model, both the underlying data and then potentially model representations to help you understand the details of this structure. Um, I'll turn back on the surfaces. So this mostly represents electron microscopy data, but in the very middle here, there's actually, we've docked a crystal structure of the capsid here. So if I now turn off the EM data and just focus in on the crystal data, you can see we've six copies of HIV capsid protein uh, where each copy is colored a different color. And I've um, represented this as both a ribbon diagram with the sides change shown. Some of you can see little, maybe little dots up here representing water molecules in the structure. We know there's a couple drugs because this has been reported in the literature that bind with HIV capsid and disrupt the formation of, the, of these multimeric units. Here's one of them from the University of Maryland and another one from Pfizer. And it's interesting to see that these bind at the interfaces between copies of the protein. Neither of these drugs are in clinical use today because although they disrupt the formation of the multimeric units, in the laboratory, after about a week or two weeks time, um, the virus mutates and the, the, mul the multimers are no longer inhibited. So that's one of the problems. I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop the demo here and just wrap up my presentation by um, Acknowledging the um, dedicated and hardworking staff I have in my lab, it takes a tremendous effort to produce functional, robust, easy to use software um, that's well documented, uh, maintained. Um, it takes professional programmers to, to do the programming. It takes, uh, since the software is going to be used by scientists, it takes scientists to do the doc, to write the documentation, to create the tutorials. It's a huge effort, and there's no way that this would be possible without a very dedicated staff and the generous generous funding that I received from the NIH. So I think I'll stop at this point, and and thank you for your attention and take any questions.